Fear is a very real thing. Moms, you guys know this real well, right? When kids are straying or there's danger or there's sickness, there's a fear that comes on you. It can be good. It can be bad. Fear can be empowering. Fear can be crippling. Fear can be used to give adrenaline in response to a great need. Or fear can be crippling where you're unable to move because you're terrified of what's ahead of you. Fear, often as a follower of Jesus, can be why we're not productive for Jesus, terrified that if we do what Jesus tells us to do, that he will make us do things that we don't want to do. And if you don't know Jesus, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then as we saw last week, we have every reason to fear. There's a lot of external fears like death, and circumstances, and suffering. But when you become a Christian, when you become a follower of Jesus, you find hope in the midst of these fears. We saw last week that the fear of death begins to dwindle because you know Jesus' death has conquered it, and he has prepared a place for you um, through his death. Fear of circumstances and suffering diminish as you know that Jesus is absolutely sovereign and good and he has a mission, greater works for you to fulfill while you are here. And we saw those two last week. You know, as I grow older in my walk with Jesus, as I grow deeper in my walk with Jesus, the greatest fears for me are not external fears of what could happen to me. The greatest fears for me are more internal of things inside of my heart. The more that I see myself in light of the gospel, the more afraid I become of myself. My heart is like the haunted house where I don't know what's behind those closed doors, and I don't want to open those closed doors, right? It's like that comic strip that says that we've met the enemy, and he is us. We are the greatest hindrance to the gospel going forward in our life and through us to the world. That's why in Jeremiah he said, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's desperately sick, who can understand it? Who can understand what's going on there? It is what lies beneath the surface that is our greatest fear. There is a stream of wickedness that flows through all of us, and we know we're capable of betraying, denying Jesus at any moment. Now, we see in our text, um, in the last several weeks, we saw Judas and Peter denying Jesus. We saw, and you know there's a Judas and a Peter in all of us. There's, and this is the fear of the disciples at this moment. They've just heard from Jesus that one of them is going to betray him and that Peter was going to deny him. And if Peter was going to do so and he was their leader, their spokesperson, how much more would they have to worry? After all, Jesus had called Peter a rock earlier. And then in a few chapters in John 16, Jesus looks at all of the disciples and says, hey, the hour is coming, the hour has come, where all of you will scatter, where all of you will abandon me, and I'm going to be left alone. I sat this week trying to picture Jesus saying that to me personally. This is why knowing the fact that nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus and that we will be with him together forever is comforting. This is why knowing that I'm here on a mission to fulfill, that there are people to serve the gospel, to proclaim a culture to impact, gives hope. But in light of all of this, I need to know that I won't go AWOL. That I need to know that God is greater than me, that God is greater than my failures, that God is greater than my sin. I need to know that above anything and everything else. And what's comforting in Scripture is that Jesus says that he knows our frailty, that he is mindful that we are but dust. He knows us all the way to the bottom. He knows us to the core, and he loves us anyway. That there is nothing that you can say or do that will shock Jesus. And this is why even at this moment, Jesus is giving the disciples hope. He knows them. This is why after Jesus tells Peter, hey, you're going to betray me, but listen, I'm going to restore you. He immediately gives hope, knowing that Peter is going to fail. And in battling this internal conflict, this indwelling sin that we have, this guilty conscience that you and I deal with, we need to know that there is something greater than our sin. That, in fact, we need to know that there is someone greater than our sin. And Jesus takes the rest of John 14 to introduce to his disciples and to us 
the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And he encourages us and says that the Holy Spirit is there to rescue us from ourselves more than anything else. Last week we saw that we have a secure place, that we have a noble purpose. This morning we're going to discover that we have a divine presence to help us battle our fears, especially the fears of failure and the fear of sin. And so we're going to dive into this text, and I know we're cutting short on time, and so I'm going to go through this, but there are five things I want you to notice about the Holy Spirit in this passage. And Jesus is going to show us several characteristics of the Holy Spirit to encourage us when we fail. The first one is that he sticks with you. The Holy Spirit sticks with you. Verse 16, John 14, verse 16, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. See, of all the things that Jesus is going to say about the Holy Spirit, the first thing that he says is that I'm going to be with you forever, that he will be with you till the end, through every failure, through every success. God doesn't just give us the Holy Spirit when we're good and take it away from us, when, take him away from us when we're bad. In the Old Testament, the Spirit's power would come and go and he would give strength and power to accomplish something that God would call him to do. Samson's a great example. There were moments when that knucklehead would be doing something stupid and doing crazy and all of a sudden the Spirit of God would come on him and he would be used by God to destroy the enemies. And then, then the Spirit would leave him and it would go back and um, when God needed to use him, the Spirit would come on him and then it would leave. And I think one of the saddest passages in Scripture is Judges 16, right after Samson tells Delilah, hey, this is how I get my strength, and Delilah cuts his hair off. Samson wakes up that next morning thinking that he can go in the same might, the same power that he did before, and Scripture says he did not know the Spirit had left him. He didn't know. He thought he was going to go in his own power. He thought that the Spirit was always there, going to be with him, and in his sin, God left, and he wasn't there. This is why... David would make prayers like in Psalm 51 after he sinned. He said, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He wanted that constant empowering of the Holy Spirit. But in our passage this morning, Jesus is not going to ask the Father to give the Holy Spirit to the disciples temporarily, but he's going to say, give it to them forever. Ephesians 1 speaks of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, a kind of like an engagement ring, promising that, hey, I'm going to stay with you and we're going to get to the altar one day. Jesus doesn't default on his promises. No matter what we do, no matter how many times we fail, there is no footnote here. There is no caveat here. There is no qualification that says, hey, I'll be with you forever until you do this sin. That's not there in Scripture. Think about it. When the disciples in this passage, they're about to do to Jesus, what they're about to do to Jesus couldn't get any worse. Peter is going to deny Jesus, and he's going to curse like a drunken sailor, and then he's going to lose his masculinity, and he's going to be afraid of a teenage girl because of Jesus. The rest of the disciples are going to run away like a dog with its tails between its legs, and they're afraid of what's going to happen. The Gospel of Mark talks about Mark running naked because he was afraid um, from the Garden of Gethsemane. It doesn't get worse for the disciples. When we battle our hearts, it's important for us to cling to the fact that God will never leave us. That God will never abandon us. That the Holy Spirit will stick with you. You cannot shake the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. He sticks with you. He never leaves you. Number two, he comforts you. Verse 16 says, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper to be with you forever. That word helper there. It is a Greek word, paraclete, which has a whole host of meanings. Every one of our Bibles, a different translations, translates it different ways. Some of your Bibles would say helper. Others of it says comforter or counselor or strengthener or advocate. It is where we get the English word paralegal from. It's the idea of someone who comes alongside of you and helps you, who intercedes you, intercedes for you and encourages you. You ever have someone that just came and sat with you when you needed someone the most? Ever have someone that came alongside of you when you were down, really discouraged? This is what the Holy Spirit does for us on a daily basis. 
And notice the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. He doesn't go in front of you and say, hey, hurry up, catch up. He doesn't stand behind you and keep pushing you forward. That doesn't, it isn't what the Holy Spirit does. He's a true companion. He comes alongside of you no matter where you are, whether you're standing strong or where you're falling to your face. He stands alongside of you. And guys, this is what marriage is supposed to be like. Men, you don't help your wives by running ahead of them, holding your hands while you're two steps ahead of them. That's not a good marriage. And you don't also help them by standing behind them, pushing them forward by being lazy and not doing anything where they do all the work. Marriage at its greatest strength is when you walk alongside each other, a united front, shoulder to shoulder. And one of the greatest ways the Holy Spirit comes alongside of you is to help you in those times of weakness and fear. To talk to the Father for you when you're too weak to do so yourself. Or when you feel like you don't, that you've sinned so much by things that you've done or by things you didn't do that God is not going to answer your prayer. And when you feel like your prayers are bouncing of the wall, that's when the Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Romans 8 says it this way, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For when we don't know what to pray as we ought, the Spirit himself intercedes for us. In the midst of our fears, when you are paralyzed, the Spirit of God will be there to help and even communicate to God for you. He is your paralegal. He is your lawyer. He is your paraclete. And he knows exactly how to pray for you according to the will of God. It's like my son, Micah, my four-year-old. Um, when we get together to pray in the evenings, um, he starts off. So he begins all of our family prayers. He's the first one to pray. And he prays and he begins. He says, Jesus, bless mommy, bless daddy, bless Chacha, which is his older brother, Chachi, which is his older sister. And he goes through this prayer, and he gets through his cousins, and there's a moment where he doesn't know what to pray. He opens his eyes, he looks up, looks at us, and this happens almost every day. He goes, now what? And he just does this, now what? And so mom and dad will have to guide him to what to pray for next or who to pray for next. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us when we don't know what to pray. But he does it even better because he doesn't just simply tell us what to pray. He actually prays for us. He intercedes for us. That's why sometimes the best prayer that you could pray is to pray in silence. Just placing yourself before God and just being quiet. All of us in this room, whether you admit it or not, acknowledge it or not, we need silence. We need those moments where we can quiet out from the noises of the world and even quiet out the noises of our own minds that are going at a million miles an hour. And we need to sit still and know that he is God. We need to be quiet. Thomas Merton um, prayed this following prayer, which I think is incredible. He said, God, I have no idea where I'm going. I don't see the road ahead of me. I cannot even know for certain where this road is going to end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm doing your will act doesn't mean I'm actually doing it. But I do believe I have a desire to please you. And, it is, and I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if my desire is to please you, that you will lead me down the right road, even though I don't even know what the right road is. Therefore, God, I trust you. Though I may be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. And you will never leave me to face life's perils alone. Sometimes you and I, we need to sit still and know that he's God. It's okay not to have all the answers to all of our prayers. It's okay not to, know, to, to not know what to pray for. In those moments, the Holy Spirit of God will be our comforter. And many times, it is that assurance that gives us, it is the assurance of the fatherhood of God. Look at what Jesus says next in John 14. He says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. An orphan is someone who's deprived of their parents. Some of you know what that's like. Jesus says, you'll never be an orphan again. You won't ever walk this earth alone again. 
when no one else is there, the Holy Spirit is with you. And Jesus says, soon the world will not see him, but you will still see. How? Because he, through the Holy Spirit, will come and abide in you and remind you of the fatherhood of God. I read a story recently of a young woman who had a horrific background. She was a daughter of a prostitute. She ended up being raised by her grandmother. And as she became a teenager, she was drawn into a church youth group, and through some friends, she came to Jesus and became a follower. Her life was radically changed, and she went off to a Christian college, got married to a Christian man, and started a family. But the marriage was struggling because she spent most of her time and resources trying to find out who her biological dad was. She haggled her mom, consistently asking, who were your clients nine months before I was born, and constantly wanting to know. And her mom didn't have the slightest idea who dad was. There was just no way for her to know. And then one day she was standing at her kitchen sink, cleaning some dishes, and she was alone. And she asked God over and over again to help her find her dad, and the fear of never finding out was haunting her and tormenting her. And in the pain and anguish of her heart, tears running down her face and dropping into the dishwater, she cried out, God, who is my father? And she just got quiet before God. And in that moment, she heard a voice. She said, she said, this is what I heard. I heard, I'm your father. I'm your father. She said the voice was so real that she turned around to see if there was someone else in the room that sneaked up behind her, but there was no one there. And she heard the voice again, I'm your father, and I will always be your father. The Holy Spirit brings comfort by talking to the Father for us and even communicating to our own hearts that we're not orphans, that we're not alone, that he doesn't leave us, that he sticks with you no matter what you're going through, that he comforts you when you need it. And the third characteristic we discover of the Holy Spirit is that he illuminates our hearts. Verse 17 says that he's the spirit of truth. The spirit reveals truth to you, especially the truths of the Bible. He reveals what it means Without the Holy Spirit, you and I would never understand. It would be black words on white paper. 1 Corinthians 2 says, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, that we might understand freely the things that have been given to us by God. The natural person doesn't expect, doesn't accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are just folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they, are, they don't have spiritual discernment. So Jesus tells us the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit, and thus they can't understand the words of God. They don't have the illuminating power, the flashlight of the Holy Spirit to shine on Scripture. Thus, they don't understand the love that God has for them. They don't get the point of life here in Jesus. The disciples here in our text are starting to get the love of God for them, but they totally, but not totally, and they clearly are not getting the mission of God that he's about to send them on. So they need the Holy Spirit to illuminate their hearts and minds to God's love and mission so that they could be used by God. In verse 21, Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. We saw this last week. The commandments in this context is the mission that Jesus is sending them on. The mission to rescue, to restore, to be salt, to be light, to gospel proclaim and be gospel neighbor, to be on mission and to show mercy. When they could see what Jesus was going to do for them on the cross, and when they would get the love of God for them, then they'd be set free to be on mission for Jesus. But at this moment, they don't get it. They think obedience to the mission is still blowing up the Samaritans and the Romans and, and overtaking Rome. That's what they think the mission is. Look at verse 22, because Judas asks this question. Judas says, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you are going to manifest yourself to us, but not to the world? Judas speaks for the whole group, as Peter's probably reeling right now. And he's saying, Jesus, we thought you were going to bring the hammer down on the Romans. 
that you were going to show your power to go ultimate fighter on these guys and that we were going to overtake them and we were going to rule. If the mission is about world domination, Jesus, why are you not exposing yourself, revealing yourself to the world? Anarchy can't just be spread just among the 12 of us. You see, the wor Romans were all about world domination. And if the disciples were going to compete with them, they needed to have something greater than the Romans. Virgil, one of the Roman poets, said, others would hammer out statues so that you can gracefully look at it. But us Romans remember that our skills are to govern people with power and to crush the arrogant in war. And the disciples here are thinking that this is what we need to compete with. We need to overtake the Romans, that the mission is to use power and influence and might to crush the Romans, and that would be the greater works that Jesus was talking about. And they thought the Holy Spirit was going to help them do that. Look at how Jesus responds, verse 23. Jesus answered them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Jesus again goes from the external back to the internal. He says, hey, listen, I'm going to come. And the Father's going to come. And we're going to set a home in your heart. Not on the thrones of this world, not in uh, palaces out there, but we're going to set our palace, our throne in your heart. And he's going to make this clear to Peter in the garden when he tells him to put his sword away. He says, hey, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, I would encourage you to fight. But that's not what I've called you to do. The disciples desperately needed the Holy Spirit to illuminate their minds to the love of God and the mission of God. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and leave you because my kingdom needs to reign in your heart before it reigns anywhere else. It has to transform you first. The spirit of truth has to teach us the love of God and the mission of God by illuminating the point of the Bible to us. And the Holy Spirit, one of the things that he does is to reveal the person and the work of Jesus to us. He reveals the gospel to us. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sends in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the things that I have said to you. Don't forget the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And the truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit is constantly showing us Jesus. The Spirit is constantly showing us who God is. My son, Micah, recently received a coloring book where he has a book that looks like it's blank pages. And he's got these uh, markers that looks like they're white. But he'll take this marker and start coloring, and all of a sudden colors start to come out of nowhere. Not the colors of the markers. It's just brand new colors are coming up. This invisible ink is creating pictures and images on this page that wasn't there through the naked eye. It reminded me of what the Holy Spirit does for us when we read Scripture. He's like the flashlight on the Scriptures revealing Jesus to us. And in dealing with our own hearts and our fears of our failure and our sin, you and I, what we need to see more than anything else is we need to see Jesus. We need to see how great he is, how marvelous it is. Because you, we will never get on mission if we don't see Jesus providing for us what we desperately need. What do we desperately need? Acceptance and love from God. See, without seeing the gospel... We'll become one of two types of people. We'll either be fearful or we'll become arrogant. We'll be fearful because we lean on our own works and realize that we aren't performing really well. And so we'll cower and we'll hide from people. Or we'll be prideful because we lean on our works and we look at others and say, well, I'm better than them. And so we judge and separate ourselves from people. Either way, your life will only be about yourself instead of about Jesus and what he has done for you. We'll be like the disciples in this text and we'll stay in our own little upper rooms and we'll never move out and do what Jesus calls us to do. Even when we get to Acts 1, after Jesus rose from the dead, in Acts 1, the disciples are still huddled up in a room 
afraid. It isn't until Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit comes on them that they finally break out of their huddle and got into the game. And then the Holy Spirit opened their eyes. All they could do was talk about Jesus, even at the risk of their own lives. Read Acts. Over 70 times, Jesus is the topic of conversation from the mouth of the disciples. In a book that's only 28 chapters, Jesus was all they could talk about when the Holy Spirit opened up their eyes. Guys, the Bible... This word is written to point us toward Jesus. This is the entire point of this book is so that we could see Jesus, that he is the hero of the story, that he is what this book is about. If the Bible was an old Western, every character would wear a black hat, but Jesus would be the one that wears the white hat. It is Jesus who is the greatest king, the greatest prophet, the greatest deliverer, the greatest priest. It is Jesus who is the greatest servant. He's the man who succeeds where every other man fail. It is in the crucifixion and resurrection that he conquers sin, redeems creation, purchases a people for eternal praise. It is here that God most displays his power, his grace, his goodness, his patience, his justice, his wrath, his mercy, his holiness, his love. It is displayed in Jesus. And as you move through the pages of scripture, the Holy Spirit repeatedly points to our need for Jesus, God's nature revealed in Jesus, and Christ's perfection and provision where we fail ourselves. Scripture is about Jesus. The Bible doesn't give us a command without the Holy Spirit pushing the reader to rem remind them of their need for grace of the gospel or motivating the reader with the gospel. The Bible doesn't proclaim a promise without the Holy Spirit calling us for dependence on grace that's only provided by the gospel. The Bible doesn't recount history without the Holy Spirit pointing to the gospel as serving as the culmination, the solution, the driving force of the substance of history. The Bible doesn't describe the glorious character of God without the Holy Spirit using the gospel as a message that brings sinful man into communion with such a glorious God. It is always pointing us to Jesus the Holy Spirit is taking the Bible and illuminating Jesus to us. He's not interested in you just knowing Bible trivia. The Bible is not an end of itself, but it's a mean to an end. Many people see the Bible as a highway with signs and warnings of what exits they need to take, but the Bible is so much more than that. The Bible is a highway that takes you somewhere. It doesn't just give you signs and warning of what exits to take, but it takes you to a destination of the person and work of Jesus. It takes you to the ocean where you jump in and enjoy Jesus. It takes you to a table where you feast on Jesus. It is about Jesus. The disciples here were afraid, afraid of the prospect that they would fail and deny and reject Jesus, that they would betray him. And they didn't at this moment need four steps to have a happy life. That's not what they needed at this moment. They needed to see Jesus on a cross dying for their sins and thus accepting them and loving them despite of themselves. And in our darkest hours when we are afraid, that's what we need the most, to see Jesus who loves us and accepts us despite us. Like the Greeks in Luke 12, we come and say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus, and the Holy Spirit says, open your scriptures, and you will see him. Just read the word, and you will see him. I could, we could spend all day on this point. We could go through every book of the Bible and show how every book of the Bible points to Jesus. But I want to show you two more things as we close. Verse 27 discovers another characteristic about Jesus, and that's that he completes. He completes. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, verse 27. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus had just spoken about giving them the Holy Spirit. Now he interchanges the concept of peace with the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who brings true peace. You know, we hear a lot about peace in the world today especially in the light of what's happening with the U.S. and North Korea and South Korea and with all of our, but our world's understanding of peace and Jesus' understanding of peace are radically different. 
for the world, peace is a ceasefire. It's no more trouble. But Jesus in Scripture teaches us that peace and conflict go hand in hand. He says in John 16, he says, I've said these things to you that you would have peace. And his next sentence is, hey, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have peace. You're going to have conflict. He says those two things go hand in hand. Because, and you say, why? Because in the Greek and the Hebrew words for peace, that word means wholeness, completeness. Not just a lack of firing and not just a ceasefire or a lack of trouble, but it's completeness. Peace is the way things ought to be. Peace is the way things were designed to be before we screwed it up. Today we live in a world that used to be a beautiful garment, but now sin has entered the world, and each person is looking out for their own, and the garment is shredded. There is no peace. Everything is torn. Relationships are torn. Societies are torn. Churches are torn. And in light of all the brokenness outside, the Holy Spirit brings healing and completeness inside so that you and I don't have to be afraid. Though all the king's horses and all the king's men wouldn't be able to put you ever back together again, the Holy Spirit could, and he is doing it. He's making you more and more into the image of Jesus daily. He repairs the holes. He takes your broken heart and mends it. As a matter of fact, he gives you a new heart when you come to Jesus. So Jesus is saying to them that he's not going to leave them in their sin, and he's not going to leave them in their failure. He's going to restore them. He's going to make them complete. The Holy Spirit will work peace into the soul of every believer. He's constantly mending. And how does Jesus bring this about? He says he's not going to give you a peace like the world gives you. What does he mean? Think about where they were. They were in Rome, and Roman peace was secured by the sword. Jesus says, I'm going to give you personal peace through the Holy Spirit, which will be secured by the cross. And while the peace of the world is conditional with diplomacy being the tactic, that if you do this, then I'll do this, and we'll come to the negotiation table, Jesus says, my peace is unconditional. There is no diplomacy involved. He does all the work. And he signs the peace agreement with his own blood. Jesus makes an unconditional covenant with us. God, through Jesus' work and applied by the Holy Spirit, through your faith, makes an unconditional promise of peace with you. In other words, he will put things back together no matter how bad you have made them. No matter how bad you've messed them up. He has dealt with the penalty of sin. He's progressively removing the power of sin. And one day he is going to take away the presence of sin from your life. You and I, we fight fear and anxiety and guilt. But we fight that knowing we have peace with God. He has and he will put the pieces back together. He will make all things new. Through faith in Jesus, we have been made right with God, reconciled to God, and are part of an unconditional covenant where God, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, has promised to put the pieces back together. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Fight fear with that truth. The Holy Spirit sticks with you. He comforts you. He illuminates Jesus to you. He completes you. And the final thing, he points. He points. Verse 30. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let's go from here. Jesus is saying, hey, Satan is getting ready for his greatest moment in history. Satan's about to be dealt with the death blow. Jesus says, hey, he's about to attack me, but he has no claim on me. He has no power. That There is nothing that Satan can touch because there's nothing Jesus has ever done wrong. He has always done what the Father has commanded. And even as he approaches the Garden of Gethsemane that evening, Jesus will submit to the Father's will. But what about us? I don't know about you, but I have done plenty 
and will do plenty for Satan to have a claim on me. But his claims will always fall flat in front of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, it talks about how the accuser of the brother stands and accuses us, accuses us before God day in and day out. And we see this in the book of Job in the Old Testament where Satan still has access to God. And Revelation says he points out the sins of people to God day and night. And Satan's right. He is right when he says this is who Sam is. That he is a sinner. That he does get angry. That he does get jealous. He does get these attitudes. That he does do all this stuff. He's right. He has every reason to say, hey, that's foul. That he screwed up. He has every right to make accusations because I am guilty. I am messed up. And the Holy Spirit points to Jesus as our lawyer, as our power of attorney, as our advocate. In John 14, verse 16, the Holy Spirit is our paralegal, but he also points to Jesus as our paralegal. In John, 1 John 2, says that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and that advocate is Jesus. See, a lawyer will stand in and represent the client so that the lawyer achieves so that the lawyer achieves what the client achieves it's all transferred i will not speak my lawyer will speak i'm not regarded i can sit there and plead the fifth i'm lost in my advocate who for the time is my representative so what is jesus doing as our advocate is jesus standing up there saying Oh, Sam, is, he's not that bad. Is he standing there like, ah, he's just screwed up this time. Would you give him one more chance? Or is he saying, oh, God, go easy on the poor guy. He didn't really mean to say that, or he didn't really mean to do that. Is this what Jesus is doing for the last 40 years of my life? If that's the case, then I'm pretty sure God is getting tired of hearing that over and over and over. And God's saying, okay, maybe one more time, maybe one more time. Meanwhile, Satan's on the side just laughing. If that was the case, there would, a time, there would be a time where that gets old. There would be a time where the father as the judge would say, you know what, enough is enough. I've given him chance after chance after chance, but he's failed over. I'm done, and I'm done hearing you spin this case for me. But you see, the text says that Jesus, it doesn't say that Jesus is our advocate as Jesus the merciful. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that Jesus Christ is our advocate as Jesus the, pers the persuasive. It says Jesus the righteous one. A really good lawyer doesn't just play on the emotions of the court. A really good lawyer has a case. And Jesus has a case. He isn't answering Satan's accusations by making excuses for me. He's probably thinking there's like, Satan, you don't even know half of it. You don't even really know how bad Sam is screwing up. And he isn't trying to plead your good works to the Father so that you could kind of ease God with the good works that you do so that God will go easy on you. He's not asking for mercy. Jesus is pleading for justice. He's saying, yeah, Father, Sam is that screwed up. Everything Satan is saying is absolutely right. But listen, I've died the death that he should have died, and I've lived the life that he should have lived. I have taken the punishment for him. I'm his advocate. He is lost in me. When you look at him, all you can see is me. You have to see everything I've done. You have to see who I am. And therefore, Father, it would be unjust for you to take two payments for something that's already been paid for. I have already paid for it. Therefore, Father, I don't ask for mercy. I demand justice. I am Jesus Christ, the righteous. And because of Sam's faith in me, I have given my righteousness to him. And now he has been set free. Brothers, sisters, you will fail. You will. But you don't need to be afraid when you fail because Jesus has already paid for your sin. He's paid for it. He pleads his own blood. There are no two payments for your sin. This is how the saints of God has always fought against the fear of their own fickle hearts. Every accusation Jesus hears, 
And Jesus says, I paid for that. When Satan says, well, Sam just got angry yesterday. Jesus says, I paid for that. Well, Sam got jealous the other day. I paid for that. Well, Sam was rude to his wife. I paid for that. Every accusation the enemy comes against you with, Jesus stands there and says, I paid for that. I paid for that. We have a great advocate. And then the father looks at the enemy and he says, Sam is my son. She is my daughter. The price has been paid. You have no claim. It is no longer, this is why Paul would say in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me because I've been crucified in Christ. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. I am so united with God that everything Jesus did in God's sight, I did. And everything Jesus said in God's sight, I said. And everything Jesus didn't do or Jesus didn't say in God's sight, I didn't say or I didn't do. Paul says that if that's the case, then I'm no longer alive. At least the I that used to live for myself, that used to live for my own life, my own, used to live for the opinions of people around me, used to find my identity and my reputation or what people thought about me. The old me is dead and gone. Friends, none of our works will make us more loved, more pleasing, or more acceptable to God. Not one thing. Sin is making its case, and Satan is making his case against you day in and day out. But we're not there. The me that was bound in sin, the me that was longing for everything in this world, the me that had this suicidal love affair with this world, the me that was on a fast track to hell is no longer there. I now have the Holy Spirit of God living in me. Oh, I still live but it's just a different me that has the eternal, holy, righteous, loving God living inside of me. So where does the Holy Spirit come in? Verse 14, verse 16 says, you have another advocate. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are both your advocates. But the Holy Spirit is not defending you to God against Satan. The Holy Spirit is there defending your own heart. Satan is saying, Satan is standing up there with God saying, hey, I paid for this, I paid for this. The Holy Spirit is advocating to you, reminding you that you are crucified with Jesus, that you no longer live, that your life is now wrapped up in Jesus, that as as a Christian you have an advocate, the Holy Spirit pointing you to Jesus, the advocate saying, look at Jesus, look at the cross, it is finished, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Some of us in this room, some of you, your sins, your failures have debilitated you from doing what God has called you to do. You say, hey, I'll wait till I get my act right, or I'll wait till I do this better, or God can never use me because of this sin or this failure. Can I tell you, you're listening more to the accusations of the devil instead of what Jesus has said about Everything that the devil says about you, Jesus looks at you and says, I paid for that. I paid for that. Some of you this morning need to stop listening to yourself and stop listening to the enemy and start listening to Jesus and start to be obedient to Jesus. As we head into communion, I'm going to invite you to reflect on the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Which of these five truths do you in your own life need to zero in on and talk to God about? Is it the truth that the Holy Spirit sticks with you and that he'll never leave you? Is it that he will comfort you and remind you that you're not an orphan, that you belong to God? Is it that he illumines your mind to the love of Jesus and the mission of God? Is it that he who began a work in you, a good work in you, will be faithful to complete it? 
Or is it that he points you to the finished work of Jesus as your advocate to remind you that the price has been paid?